All right, hey folks. Continuing on, chapter eight. Love me some flaming lips. All right. So, learning goals. Okay, so um, we've gone through drawing Lewis structures for covalent and polar covalent compounds. Okay. Um, so what we're going to continue along with here, oops, let me get uh, my highlighter. Um, what I'm going to continue along with here, um, assuming that I know what I'm doing on my computer. Okay. So we, we've started getting into the Lewis structures of covalent and polar covalent, obeying the octet rule. And in that last lecture, um, we used that, uh, we looked at Clark's rule to do double bonds and triple bonds, um, but we haven't looked at deficient valency or expanded valency yet, okay? So that's what I'm going to pick up with from here. Um, so that's learning goal five. Also in this video, I think we should have time to do learning goals six, seven, and eight as well to wrap up um, the remaining things of Lewis structure. But I'm keeping my eye on the time, and uh, let's see how we go, okay? So exceptions to the octet rule, because of course there are, because chemistry is the science of exceptions. Um, so the second row elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, always obey the octet rule, right? So down here, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, um, they always obey the octet rule. However, boron and beryllium often have fewer than eight electrons, okay? So they are, um, that's what's called um, a deficient in their valency. So they have less than the octet rule, okay? And that's because they're small, right? These, we remember from our periodic trends, um, that boron, beryllium, lithium, these are very small atoms, okay? So they can often take fewer than eight and be okay with that. Um, but the main thing is the second row elements never exceed the octet rule. They just don't have enough space to do it. They're not big enough. Okay. However, the third row elements, so now starting with sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicone, etc., and below, so third row and below, they often satisfy the octet rule. However, they can exceed the octet rule because with that level three, Okay, uh, 3D is possible. So they can spill into the D orbitals. And because they can spill into the D orbitals, they can exceed the octet rule. So we call this an expanded valency. And on the um, other lecture, I called that Texas-sized valency because everything is big in Texas. So when writing the Lewis structure, okay, try to satisfy the octet rule first. And if there are extra electrons remaining, they can be placed into atoms having D block electrons. So things at level three and higher. Of course, Clark's rule will also help us predict that. And we're going to see this next. Okay. So draw Lewis structures for the following molecules. All right. Um, so I'm going to place some music in the background. And I'm just going to keep going like I've been doing. Um, I'm going to first sum up the valence electrons. Then I'm going to do Clark's rule. And then after I see Clark's rule, I'm going to make my decision on if I need um, extra electrons, like in the form of a double bond, or perhaps I need an expanded valency, or perhaps I need a smaller, a deficient valency. Okay? So let's do it. Let's bring back... The flaming lips here. Okay, here we go. PCO5. So phosphorus. One, two, three, four, five. And chlorine, seven times five. So now Clark's rule. Let's 
six atoms. Six non-hydrogen atoms, right? Plus two equals 38. If X is less than the number of valence electrons, expanded valency. And we can see that because this is a phosphorus with five chlorines, right? So phosphorus has the higher bonding capacity, okay? And I've got five chlorines to put around this thing. So my phosphorus is Texas sized, right? It can take 10. It has 10 electrons. But let's count them up. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 out of my 40, okay? And now I'm going to use the remaining electrons to satisfy the octet rule, okay? So now that's 2, 4, 6, 8 per chlorine, right? 8, 16, 24, 32, 40. Brilliant. That's it. Okay. BF3. One, two, three for boron. Seven for fluorine, and there's three of them to give me 24 valence electrons. Okay. What about Clark's rule? Six times four plus two gives me 26. So do I expect double bonds? Maybe from Clark's rule, okay? However, boron is an exception. Boron often just takes three bonds or six electrons, okay? I have to turn this music off, I'm so distracted. I, I hope I haven't distracted you with it. I was having fun, now I've got to focus. Okay, so um, as I said, boron often takes three or six electrons, boron and beryllium both, okay? So this is where Clark's rule might confuse you a little bit. So watch out for those boron and beryllium exceptions. And now I'm gonna fill in the rest of my electrons, okay? Two, four, six, eight, 16, 24. Great. Okay, so I'll circle these. Okay, so that's it. Okay, SF6, we did this one already, if you recall. I think we did this one already. Uh, but let's do it again. So sulfur is one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, plus each fluorine. And there's six of those, and each fluorine has seven. So that gets me 40 eight electrons I have to use around. And now with my Clark's rule, six times seven plus two, uh, that gives me 44. So the fact that that's different by four tells me that SF6 has, or that sulfur has four more electrons than the octet rule. So 12 in total. So let's see how that works out. Okay, so you can tell just from the formula, hopefully you can tell from the formula that it seems reasonable that it's going to be a sulfur surrounded by six fluorines, right? So eight is the norm, but look, now sulfur has two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So that's how I got to that number twelve because the difference between that of four, four less, tells me there should be an expanded valency for sulfur by four. Okay. And so now we've got to use up all 48 of our electrons. And hopefully you can tell by now the way this is going to go. We're going to just fill up the octet rule for all these fluorines. And I'm not going to count up to 48, but if we were to count them, that's right. We would arrive um, at 48. Okay, so that's SF6. Okay, so this one's interesting. ICL minus. Okay. So iodine has seven valence electrons. Each chlorine has seven, and there's four of them, plus one extra electron because of the minus charge, right? 
And so that gives me, uh, 7 times 4 is 28. Uh, so that gives me 36 valence electrons that I've got to spread around. So there's five non-hydrogen atoms. 6 times 5 plus 2 gives me 32. Okay, so now this one's interesting. Because you can see it's also less by 4, just like this one. Okay, And if I start spreading around these bonds, you notice that I've only got four chlorines. So how is it that I'm going to get 12 electrons around the iodide? Well, let's just wait on that and let's finish the lone pairs for chlorine. And let's see how many we have remaining. Okay, so we need to use 36, right? So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. So I have four left. Where are they going to go? 33, 34, 35, 36. They're going to go on the iodine. And that's why this has an expanded valency, right? Because we noted that eight should be the norm. But when there's a difference of four, that means really iodine is going to have 12. And here it is, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, okay? And because this is an ion, we put brackets around it and put the minus charge, and there's our Lewis structure for ICL4 minus. Okay, beautiful. So I'm going to move on to the next topic here, okay? Oops, uh, this button, all right. So we did know how to draw Lewis structures for the exceptions using Clark's rule, okay? So now moving on to learning goal six, know how to draw Lewis structures for compounds with resonance. So what is resonance? A resonance structure is two or more structures with the same arrangement of atoms, but different arrangements of bonding pairs of electrons. Okay. And as an example, um, this is O3, ozone, and ozone has a resonance structure. So when you go up and do all of the rules for ozone, um, which we could do really quick. One, two, three, four, five, six for each oxygen. Six times three means um, 18, okay? Um, there's six times three non-hydrogen atoms equals 20. And so the fact that this is two more tells me I need only one double bond. But when I have these three oxygen molecules, right, because I only need one double bond, there's going to be one double bond and one single bond. Well, the resonance becomes in that this double bond, it actually can switch. And the way that this molecule actually exists, if I were to draw how this thing, you know, exists in nature, those bonds are being shared. I'm going to draw like a dotted line, dotted line and dotted line. Um, and so there, there really is like a resonance between those two. So really the way the molecule exists is kind of like with a half a bond here and a half a bond there. But the way we represent that with Lewis structure is to show, is show both possibilities, okay? And so sometimes you might be asked to draw all possible structures for a molecule and that means it likely has resonance structures, okay? So let's look at nitrate, NO3 minus. So nitrogen has five. There's three oxygens, and each one of them has six um, plus a negative charge, right? Um, so that's going to give me 18, 19, uh, 24 electrons to distribute, okay? Clark's rule tells me six times four plus two equals 26. So the fact that Clark's rule was two more means I need one double bond. Okay. So we can see nitrogen has the bigger bonding capacity. So I'm going to put it in the middle and there's three oxygens that I need to put around this thing. Okay. And this tells me that I need one double bond. So I'm just going to add one double bond to this thing and I'm going to fill in the remaining electrons, right? Notice that I only put two on this oxygen because it has a double bond. That's going to give it the octet rule. 
And let's make sure we've used all 24. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Great. We also remember that this is an ion, so I put a negative charge. Okay. Um, but now, hopefully that you can see, um, there's going to be a resonance structure. And there's going to be three resonance structures in total for this bond flipping around to those three bonds. So I've got one of the resonance structures already drawn. Let's make the other two. Okay, and it doesn't really matter which order you flip them around. Okay, keep in mind now this electron pair now goes up to six, whereas this electron pair only goes to four. Okay, so this is one of our resonance structures. Um, and as you can see, the last resonance structure is that double bond flipping around to that other side. Okay. Beautiful. So when we're, if we're asked to indicate all possible structures of a molecule, we have to do it. We have to indicate that there's three possible resonance structures. All right, what about SO3? Let's do that one. Okay, so sulfur is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So six plus, and then same, oxygen has, uh, let's see here, um, three times let's see, uh, six, I just lost my train of thought. Yes, to give me 24. So you can see it's gonna be the same process as the um, nitrate, right? The same numbers work out, okay? But SO3 is not an ion, right? It's a, it's a stable neutral molecule. So that means it's gonna look very similar to my Nitrate, right? Where now I'm going to have three more or three in total resonance structures. Okay, great. And then the last one, sorry if I'm getting a little sloppy with my drawing here. Okay, great. So we've got to include all resonance structures. All right. So, and often it, it can be pretty tricky deciding. Um, if something is going to have a resonance structure. So first, follow the rules, right? Do the valence electrons, then do Clark's rule. And if you arrive at this situation where you need one double bond, but you have like, let's say, two or three places where you could put it, that means you're going to have a resonance structure, okay? Great, so moving on. So now we have the ultimate and final rule for Lewis structure. Um, and that's called the formal charge, okay? So formal charge, let me see. Yep, I got examples coming up. So formal charge is used to evaluate the best Lewis structures, particularly for atoms exceeding the octet rule, okay? And so formal charge has an equation right here, and the equation goes number of valence electrons, and we do this formal charge for each atom, okay? So this would be um, for each atom, just its number of valence electrons that we get right off the periodic table, okay? And now this is going to be minus, now for this atom, right, for each atom, really I should point it to there, okay? It's going to be the number of sh unshared electrons plus one half the number of bonding electrons. And notice that's not the number of pairs, it's the number of electrons. So I have a really easy way to remember this crazy formula. Number of unshared electrons plus one half the number of bonding electrons. It's dots for this chunk plus sticks for that chunk, right? Because if you think about it, one half the number of bonding electrons just gives you the number of bonds, right? Because there's two electrons in each bond. So when you take one half of that, you're really just counting up the dots plus the sticks. Okay, so it's an easy way to remember it. Valence electrons minus, and remember, so this is like all in a parentheses together. So we get that negative sign distributed through correctly. Number of valence electrons minus dots plus sticks. Easy. Okay. So rules, the sum of the formal charges on all atoms in a given molecular ion must equal 
the total charge. So if something is neutral, if it's completely neutral, all of those formal charges have to add up to zero. However, if it's a polyatomic ion, um, like nitrate, for example, nitrate is minus one, all of the formal charges have to add up then to minus one, to whatever its charge is, okay? Number two, if non-equivalent Lewis structures exist, those with formal charges closest to zero are good, and negative formal charges on the most electronegative elements are also considered good. So for example, if you draw up a structure and then something like, you know, oxygen or fluorine has a positive one formal charge, that's no bueno. Oxygen and fluorine are super electronegative. They don't want to be positive. They want to be negative. Okay. So let's do some examples. And there's um, two really good ones. And um, sulfate and phosphate. And these are ubiquitous. So these are very common. Okay. So now let's first do, let's do all the rules that we know. Okay. And so that is, um, you know, we add up the valence electrons. So sulfur is one, two, three, four, five, six, plus four oxygens, and each one of them are also six, plus two extra for the negative charge. Okay. And what we get out of that is, uh, let's see, 24 plus six makes 32. So that's 32. Okay. So now we do Clark's rule. And Clark's rule says six, so five non-hydrogen atoms plus two, and that equals 32. Huh. So what's the deal, man? Why am I using this as an example? Because this just says we should be good to go, right? This says we expect it that it's just going to be all single bonds. Okay. Um, let me make this much bigger. Oops. So the Clark's rule says we should all have single bonds. And if I go and do all of the right uh, lone pairs, if I fill them all around, and I consider that this whole thing is negative two, then this should be the Lewis structure, right? This is what you would expect. But Chemistry is the science of exceptions. So now I'm going to do the formal charges of this structure, and we're going to see if that's the best possible structure. Okay? So let's first do the sulfur. Okay? So the sulfur is, uh, valence electrons are six, and it's minus dots plus sticks. Okay? So this sulfur doesn't have any dots, so that's zero, plus sticks, one, two, three, four. All right? So that equals a positive two. So this tells me the formal charge on just this sulfur is a positive two, okay? So when you're doing some homework assignments and they ask you to include formal charges, and I'm gonna go through this um, in a discussion on Tuesday, you'll, you have to add that plus two to the sulfur, okay? You have to indicate that that sulfur is plus two. So now what about oxygen? Well, we only have to do it for one because all four of these oxygens are equivalent. And we know oxygen has six valence electrons. And now minus dots. So one, two, three, four, five, six dots. Okay. Plus one stick. And so six minus seven equals negative one. So that's good that we got a negative for oxygen because oxygen is electronegative. And we note all of these oxygens are equivalent, okay? So this is minus one, this is minus one, this is minus one, and this is minus one. And in fact, all of those would add up to the negative two charge on sulfur, right? Plus two, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, gives me minus two. However, this is not the best Lewis structure, okay? And I'll show you why. So now I don't have any predictive way of telling you how to arrive at the best Lewis structure, but I'll just show you what is the observed Lewis structure and I'll tell you why it's the observed Lewis structure. 
So as it turns out, without using anything of Clark's rule, we can make a better Lewis structure for this thing by doing the following. Uh, just two. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. This, as it turns out, is the best Lewis structure. Okay? And this is why. So now if I go to do the formal charges now, okay? And you notice we've made Texas sulfur. We, we expanded the valency of sulfur, right? We busted the octet rule. But we can do that for sulfur. Um, remember the compound SF6, let's find it, right? SF6 is a stable compound that it consists with sulfur taking 12 electrons. And here sulfur is taking 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 electrons. So we know it can do it. So now if I count up the formal charge of this sulfur, it's still six valence electrons minus zero dots, however, now it's got six sticks. That gives me a formal charge of zero. And for the central atom, a formal charge of zero is much better than a formal charge of plus two. So we've already improved that, okay? Now, what about the double bonded oxygen? So I'll draw that by saying double bonded oxygen, okay? So what is its formal charge, all right? Well, it's still six valence electrons for each oxygen, and it's got one, two, three, four dots plus one, two sticks. So six minus six equals zero, so that's great. And this is something really important to note here. Okay, you don't have to memorize this, but if you're a chemistry major, maybe this is a good thing to commit to memory. Whenever you have a double bonded oxygen like this, and it doesn't matter what it's bonded to. So that's why like, I kind of drew that squiggly. A double bonded oxygen always has a formal charge of zero. Always. No matter what it's bonded to. Right? Because when we counted up this formal charge, we didn't consider what it's bonded to. So double bonded oxygens always have formal charges of zero. All right, what about my single bonded oxygens? Okay. Uh, oops, let's, let's indicate that on there, right? Um, that's a zero formal charge, and that's a zero formal charge. And that's a zero formal charge, okay? So now my single bonded oxygen, which I'll draw like that, still six valence electrons, minus, and now there's one, two, three, four, five, six dots, plus one stick. Um, so that's negative one, and which we came up with the same thing over here, right? So another good rule of thumb is all single bonded oxygens always have formal charges of negative one. So now this has a negative one, and this has a negative one, and zero plus zero plus zero plus minus one plus minus one will give me minus two, okay? So now how do I know that this is the correct observed Lewis structure of sulfate? Well, check it out, okay? We know that sulfate um, when you add, let's say, um, 2H plus plus SO4 2 minus, we make sulfuric acid, H2SO4, right? So why is it that it takes exactly two hydrogens? Because of the negative one oxygens, right? So H2SO4, sulfuric acid has a Lewis structure that looks like this, okay? With the hydrogens bonded to those singly bonded oxygens, because these singly bonded oxygens are negative one, all right? So they're perfect, they're primed and ready to take on two hydrogens in the case of sulfuric acid. So that's how we know that this is the observed Lewis structure of sulfate because of the way the hydrogens bond. Okay, so now I want you to try phosphate on your own. I'm gonna put it on the discussion worksheet so you'll get a chance to do it. Um, but see if you can come up with what the best Lewis structure for phosphate is. And I'll give you a hint. 
We know that when we add three hydrogens to this thing, right? If I say three H plus plus one phosphate, we make phosphoric acid. So it seems reasonable that there's probably three single bonded oxygens and one double bonded oxygen. See if you can come up with that on your own, okay? I'm gonna move on to the next slides. And the very last thing that I wanna talk about in this lecture um, are these odd electron molecules that we call free radicals or sometimes just radicals, okay? And yes, if you've heard, uh, you know, I, I always think of like the Palm Wow commercials or like the orange juice commercials. Um, this fights anti-oxidizing free radicals. They're talking about odd electron molecules, okay? So, a free radical is a molecule or an atom that contains unpaired electrons, okay? That means they're very reactive. Electrons like to exist paired up if they can, right? So, but free electrons, or free radicals, because they contain unpaired electrons, they're super reactive. They react very fast, and they usually react very violently, okay? So free radicals are often excellent oxidizing agents because if you recall, oxidation is a loss of electrons. So free radicals are really good at stealing electrons from other things to pair up their missing electrons. So they're very reactive, okay? So here's two examples. So here's OH minus so this is the hydroxide ion, okay, which we know contains um, oxygen is six electrons, hydrogen is one, and then there's a negative charge, plus one gives me eight valence electrons for hydroxide, OH minus. The Lewis structure we would come up with for this thing looks like this. So hydrogen duet rule, oxygen, octet rule, and it's a negative ion, right? So it's going to look something like that, okay? Now, what about OH without the minus? That's really important. That's not a typo. So when you see this in chemistry, um, you know, keep in mind that that's purposeful. We can have this thing called OH without the minus. This is called the hydroxyl radical, okay? And as it turns out, the hydroxyl radical is super important um, in Earth systems chemistry. Hydroxyl radical occurs naturally in our atmosphere, um, and it's often referred to as the Clorox bleach of the atmosphere. So it is a natural occurring oxidizing agent that's really good at reacting with organic molecules in the atmosphere. Okay, so it's something I study in my research. So now the hydroxyl radical is six oxygens plus one for hydrogen, but there's no negative charges, so that gets seven electrons, so that's an odd electron molecule, right? It's got an unpaired electron because it has seven. So hydrogen is still gonna follow the duet rule but now what happens is, there we go, that oxygen only has seven. Two, four, six, seven. So that's the correct Lewis structure for the hydroxyl radical. And it's extremely reactive. So this thing can strip electrons off of about damn near anything, okay? Which causes it to corrode and react away. So now what about nitrite, NO2 minus, okay? So we know nitrite has five for nitrogen, and there's two oxygens, and each one is six, plus a negative charge. So that gives me 12, 17, that gives me 18 electrons. Everything's paired up. And if we were to do the Lewis structure, uh, let's actually do Clark's rule first. Six times three plus two gives me 20. So this has a double bond. Additionally, it has a resonance structure. Okay, so it's gonna look like this, oxygen, double bond, nitrogen, single bond, um, because difference of two tells me one double bond, 
Okay. Um, let me get rid of this guy right here. All right. So uh, let's see. Two, four. Okay. Brilliant. Um, and then we should note that, right, it's got a negative charge. Okay. And additionally, there's a resonance structure, right? So the double bond can switch sides, okay? Like that. Brilliant. Okay, minus. All right, very good. So now, what about this NO2, okay? Sorry, I'm flipping to another source right now because I just thought of something that I want to make sure of. So what about this NO2? Well, if we were to count up these things, okay, um, then what we would actually find, okay, is that it has 17, right? You can see it's 5 plus 2 times 6, 5 for nitrogen plus 2 oxygens times 6, that gives me 17, okay? But we know that we need to distribute 20 of these things around, all right? So when we go to do that now, we're going to have an oxygen, double bond nitrogen, single bond, okay, just like we did here. I'm going to put the electrons around the best way that I can. And keep in mind that what I want to be able to do is follow the, the rules for formal charge as well. And so what that means is nitrogen is going to take the radical. Excuse me, I forgot to put a two of them right there. Nitrogen's going to take the radical. Nitrogen's going to take the unpaired electron. And the reason for that is, is because now when I do these formal charges, okay, I know all double bonded oxygens, I remember from the last side, all double bonded oxygens are zero. All single bonded oxygens are negative one. And so now what's the formal charge on this nitrogen? Well, nitrogen is five, one, two, three, four, five, minus the dots plus sticks. So that's one dot plus one, two, three sticks. So uh, if you follow that formula quickly, that ends up being plus one. And that's not terrible for nitrogen. Better to be plus one on nitrogen than plus one on oxygen. Because if we put the radical on the oxygen, then the oxygen would be a zero but a single bond in oxygen really wants to be a negative one, okay? So, and of course, we still have a resonance structure where this can now um, flip, the oxygen can flip the other side, right? But the radical is still, <laughs> ah, bless me, the radical is still in the nitrogen. And so this also makes NO, um, NO2 rather, excuse me, extremely reactive. All right, so there's one more example that I want to bring up, okay, while we're talking about oxides of nitrogen, and that's NO, the NO molecule, okay? And so the NO molecule is also a radical. I'm just going to quickly draw that Lewis structure for you. Okay, NO, nitrogen monoxide, looks like this, and there's also a radical on the nitrogen, okay? And we know NO2 looks like this, so those are extremely reactive. So why am I talking about NO and NO2? Well, as it turns out, NO and NO2 make up what we call NOx, which we call NOx. For those of you that live in California, particularly Southern California, you might have heard of NOx. NOx is a precursor to smog. That's right, that brown crap in the air, particularly the Los Angeles air. Um, it is made from these two radicals, from NO and NO2. Well, where do these two radicals come from? Well, as it turns out, they come from the following reaction, nitrogen plus oxygen under really high heat make NOx. So it goes back and forth between NO and NO2 because they're so reactive, okay? So where could we get enough heat to generate that? Not on a hot day, because even on a hot day, 
we've got plenty of nitrogen and oxygen that we're able to breathe. It's not forming NOx because that would poison us if we breathed it in. Okay, NOx, NOx, NO and NO2 is very toxic. Um, just like the OH radical, all these radicals are toxic for us because they are extremely reactive. Okay, um, so where does it come from? Well, you can get enough heat to generate this in a tailpipe of the internal combustion engine. That's right, your automobile. The engine and the tailpipe in your car get hot enough to actually make nitrogen and oxygen in the air, right? In the ambient air surrounding your automobile. Uh, it, it makes it hot enough to form these NO and NO2 radicals which get pumped out into the atmosphere and they chew apart damn near anything and they go on to form smog. So this is why you get your car smog checked. You get your car smog checked to prevent the buildup of NOx. So what builds up the NOx? Maybe you car heads already know. It's your catalytic converter. Your catalytic converter prevents the buildup of these radicals. So that's why you should definitely take getting your car smog checked seriously. This is my public service announcement from one California to another Californian, okay? Keep our air clean. Get your car smog checked. Take that rule seriously. Um, because without that rule in place, our air pollution would be awful, okay? So, and you can definitely read more about that and I can talk to you more about that if you like. Um, the book has some really cool information about NOx and smog and your catalytic converter. Um, so, but this is really cool, interesting stuff, real world stuff that I'm teaching you here. Um, okay, folks, that was a pretty long video. So we're just gonna have one more short video for this section. So we did Lewis structure um, for compounds with resonance. We did formal charge. And we just spent some time talking about radicals, odd electron molecules, okay? So um, the next video should be pretty short covering these last three learning goals. Okay, folks, hasta luego.